Okay, the human fossil record begins about six million years ago, and by that time humans are already bipedal. So we can look at Aurorin, there's not a lot of Aurorin's skeleton, but enough of the femur for us to see that the joint is the type of joint that we have that leads to bipedal walking, and not the type of joint that more like chimps and gorillas have, which is for mostly hunched over walking. Sahalanthropus, we really only have the skull, and we can see that there's not a lot of room for brains. There's a big brow ridge here. The face is kind of sloped forward, kind of like modern chimpanzees and gorillas. Artipithecus ramidus, we only have teeth. Again, teeth fossilize better than bone, um, but human teeth are very distinct from chimp and gorilla teeth. And then Australopithecus anamensis, um, again, we only have teeth, but we actually have some of the palate, and so we can see kind of distinctive human shape of the palate in these guys as well. A little bit more recently, we have the gracile Australopithecines. So this is what Lucy is. Lucy is a very famous, very complete skeleton. So we have her hips and we have parts of her feet. So we can see that she walked bipedally. Her canines are reduced, so much smaller canines um, than our ancestors appeared to have based on how big the canines are in chimps and gorillas. This is about uh, four million years ago to three million years ago. And Australopithecus africanus, a little bit more recent, the teeth are bigger, the canines are even more reduced, and one of the things we can notice that's going to be a trend that's happening within the evolution of the skull here is that there's not a lot of space here for brains, but now the space in the skull devoted to brains is getting larger. The face is kind of sloped forward here, right? The eyes are well set back of the front of the teeth. One of the things we'll see as we look at the skulls is that the the area devoted to teeth and the mouth will be shrinking and the profile will actually become more vertical. And in fact, the third pattern that we see in skulls over time is that that frame and magnum is going to be moving forward as we have more and more bipedal stance. The robust Australopithecines, again more recent, you can see the small area devoted to brain, you can see the sloped face. So you have Australopithecus boisei, Australopithecus robustus. And these are kind of living coincidental with the gracile Australopithecines. Another group of early humans is the genus Homo. So Homo rudolfensis and Homo habilis. So this is about 1.8 to about 2.5 million years ago. This is within the last 2 million years. And you can see now the brain is getting bigger. The brain is getting bigger. The face, the slope of the face is more vertical than it was in the Australopithecines. And we also find evidence of stone tools. And in particular, we find that these stone tools have been manufactured and shaped. So they're not just using stones to do stuff, like maybe some of those birds were doing. They're actually taking stones and using other stones to sharpen them, to create knives, which is something that um, other animals don't really do very much. Chimpanzees fashion some of their sticks for fishing, but most animals don't really modify tools that they use them, they just work with what they find. Whereas we see two million years ago evidence that humans are thinking about what they're doing and modifying their tools. A couple more Homo species, so Homo erectus, more recent than the other ones, and then Homo ergaster. So again, big brains, the face is becoming very vertical, that frame and magnum has now moved up into the position that we have it in now. If you look at the skeleton of the body, it's very modern. It's actually very difficult to distinguish these from modern humans, except for the size. We see stone tools, and we see evidence of controlled fire. So we find campfires, and we find sticks that have been deliberately burned. So evidence that humans now had control over fire, and this may account for the reduced size of the mouth, because once we can start cooking our food, and it's softer and easier to eat, we don't need these gigantic mouths with lots of muscles to eat. We can actually work with the much smaller mouths that we have in modern skulls. Three more, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis, and Homo sapiens, which is what we are. These guys lived in Europe. They are were robust. They had very bigger skeletons than kind of we do. Neanderthals also had big brains. You can see they have that big round brain area there. They have the the vertical profile, not quite as much as Homo sapiens does, not quite as big a brain as Homo sapiens, but really quite similar. 
Interestingly, there's evidence in Neanderthals that there was medicine, or at least care, for the very severely wounded. There's a, a skeleton where the femur is completely broken and then healed afterwards. So if you think about how useful you would be if your femur was completely broken, the answer is not at all. And if you were an animal, you would die. But this Neanderthal managed to survive and live for a number of years afterwards, maybe because other individuals were taking care of it. And then there's even some evidence that maybe they were thinking about religion or the afterlife. There have been um, Neanderthal skeletons discovered in kind of wells or pits with flower petals put on top of them. And these were flower petals that are kind of not mixed in with the whole thing. These are obviously flower petals that were deliberately placed on the body when that body went into that hole. Um, and so maybe these guys are thinking about afterlife or funerals or something like this, right? Today at funerals we often bring flowers in. So there's evidence that these guys, these animals, right, Homo neanderthalensis, are relatives, not Homo sapiens. There's evidence that in many ways they were actually a lot like us. But they did not survive past about 30,000 years ago. Roughly when Homo sapiens got to Europe, most likely um, killed them off. So Homo sapiens evolved within Africa within the last one to 200,000 years, so very, very recent, and that's the species that all modern humans are now. Here's a diagram depicting the evolutionary history. So we have Pongo, orangutan, that's not a group, and then gorilla, splitting off about eight million years ago. And then we have humans splitting from chimps, and the two chimps splitting from each other more recently. And then we don't really know how all these different skeletons and fossils that we're finding are related to one another, because again, the fossil record is fragmentary. We don't have any DNA from any of these things. So although we know that we have Homo sapiens now and Neanderthals got very recent, we don't really know if any of these are our ancestors or which of these might be relatives of our ancestors. So kind of overall, we have Sahelanthropus, Aurobrin, Ardipithecus. We don't have a lot of detailed information. Australopithecines appear to have spread throughout Africa and did quite well. Homo erectus spread throughout Africa and also emigrated out, and we find Homo erectus fossils in the rest of the world. So you do find fossils of Homo outside of Africa. And then Homo sapiens spread throughout Africa and then emigrated to the rest of the world and it either eliminated or interbred with Erectus and Neanderthalensis when it encountered them, and the most likely thing is that it actually killed them off because we don't have a lot of genetic evidence for large amounts of interbreeding. So the current best model for modern humans is that we are the result of a single recent migration out of Africa. This is different from an older model that was quite popular and a lot of people um, thought it to be true, that of parallel evolution of the erectus lineages, right? Because the world had Homo erectus all over the place. Maybe Homo erectus worldwide evolved kind of convergently to Homo sapiens, which was the previous model. So that model was actually termed the multi-regional model. This is this idea that maybe as long as two million years ago, Homo erectus left Africa, some stayed in Africa, some went to Asia, some went to Europe. And then in parallel, they all evolved to become modern Homo sapiens. And then the more recent hypothesis, called the Out of Africa hypothesis, that about 100,000 years ago, there was a single group that left Africa and then migrated to the rest of the world, replacing the Homo species that had been there previously. So when you read the paper in this part of the course that talks about the multi-regional versus the Out of Africa hypothesis, this is what they're talking about. Prior to DNA data, the multi-regional hypothesis, this one here, was favored by many biologists and a lot of anthropologists for a number of reasons. For example, the morphological characters um, of Homo erectus in Asia looks a lot like morphological characteristics of Homo sapiens in Asia, in particular the zygomatic arches, the cheekbones. And so there's superficial similarity between the fossils of these guys and the fossils of these guys. But once we got molecular evidence and got DNA sequences, this model no longer holds up. This model um, becomes far more likely. And although there may have been some interbreeding with Neanderthals, if there was, 
there wasn't a lot of it. So the paper that you're reading for this part of the course has a figure that shows haplotype frequencies. And so if we take those frequencies and map them on here, you can see there's four African populations and they're very genetically diverse. They have a wide range of different combinations of these alleles. And then as we move out of Africa, this first population is one in the Middle East, you can see that they really only have three of the combinations that are present within Africa. And then moving up into Europe, same three combinations. So these two populations appear to be very genetically similar and distinct and are a distinct subset of the possible combinations here. And then if we think about moving across Asia, now this population in Asia has only two out of those three haplotypes at high frequencies. And it's those same two that we see in North America with a crossing of humans across this land bridge into North America and South America. You see these individuals look very much like these individuals genetically, these individuals being most likely descended from individuals that had these three alleles. So when you're reading this paper, and I know the paper is kind of complex and has quite a bit of terminology, this diversity led to when a small group left, they only took a portion of this genetic diversity with them due to random chance, genetic drift, that sort of thing. This is the subset that exited Africa and went to the rest of the world. So in fact, most humans in the world, so that is all the people outside of Africa, are the descendants of one group that wasn't very large that left Africa. And the time frame for this is about 100,000 years ago, an exit from Africa. Europe settled 40,000 years ago or so, 35,000 years. Movement across Asia, the land bridge and movement into the Americas, movement through South Asia and settling of Australia, right? the Aborigines and Pacific Islanders here. These dates are all approximate, and as we get more and more genetic data, we refine some of these things. But these general numbers have actually held up really quite well. And the genetic relationships that we just looked at, they show a migration pattern that was not obvious from skin color, for example. So this is a plot of genetic similarity. So you have kind of zones of gradation moving out from Africa. And this was a little surprising to people because when we looked at morphological traits, before we had our DNA data, if you just look at skin color, it's kind of all over the place. So uh, fair enough, Africa has individuals with very dark skin, but so does Australia, and so do regions in um, North America and South America, right? Native Americans. And then of course you have light, very light skin color here, like Scandinavians. This trait, which we focus so much on, skin color light to dark, which had been thought to reflect relatedness, turns out to be terrible at reflecting relatedness, doesn't do a very good job at all, and that's because it's such a plastic morphological trait. Natural selection to lighten or darken skin color is very effective, so you can have lots of reversals and convergences, which leads to lots of homoplasy, which makes that trait an unsuitable one for reconstructing evolutionary history, unlike other genetic traits give us a much better sense of the history.